Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for Monday, June 23rd. My name is Scott Bugby. To my right is Jim Lehan. To my left is Jeff Palumbo. And to Jeff's left is Marion Harrington, our town administrator. Just want to remind folks. Town promoted. administrator. There you go. Sorry. Sorry, Jack. See, you're not here? I'll leave it at that. How quickly we uh, forget. <laughs> Excuse me. Let everyone know this meeting is being videotaped and audio taped. Um, uh, read tonight's agenda. We're going to have at 7 o'clock, we have Ann Proto, our recreation director, discussing the benches for Town Hill. At 7.20, Doug Tepman from Ashton Solar is going to come in to talk to us a little bit about what he's been doing or what's going on with solar. 8.20, we have a Highland Lake Dam discussion. Under the Town Administrator Report, we will uh, vote to approve the SERG contract awards for DPW, review directional signs, uh, consider a selectman appointments for 2015, consider disclosure by Peter Diamond, any other discussion items, and hopefully uh, accept minutes. With that, Ann, would you like to join us up here? Sure. Thank you. They don't have it on. I don't have Jack to put it on the screen. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Proto, Rec Director. Um, I am here to talk to the selectmen about um, re working working on the gazebo so specifically there are a few things we'd like to do um, we'd like to take down the railings that are currently on the gazebo the bottom railings uh, we would keep the top um, decorative uh, railings um, and we would like to um, replace the benches around the outside of the uh, gazebo and um, we would also like to paint um, the gazebo uh, we'd like to take down the railings because one they're rotting they're very hard to maintain and they're also the place that uh, graffiti finds itself if it's going to find itself there um, so uh, in addition it's also not having the railings there we think they would be more conducive to the town the summer concerts um, it's just more, more open and I've talked to Bob Bullock he's gone over he's actually going to work on the painting part um, I'm going to work on getting the, the railings down and um, patching the pat doing any patchwork. And then um, after the first of the year, he's going to address the painting of it. Um, but recreation has also has, um, has looked into getting benches. And this was actually, we started this because of uh, the family of Helen and Stan Collins came to us and they wanted to purchase a memorial bench for their parents celebrating 50 years in Norfolk. And this is how this whole project started. We w went around town and looked at different places. And we got to Town Hill, and their daughters were like, this is the perfect place. This is where we'd like to have the bench. And you know, I, we started looking, looking at the benches that are there, and it's like, these benches are in really rough shape. And then, you know, we just thought, let's make, take this as an opportunity to make the town, you know, improve the town hill across the board. Um, the bench that we're proposing, there's actually a small bench version of that on town hill already. It's the cedar color with black. It's by Dumore. Dumore is a very popular um, commercial brand of uh, bench. Um, and I've, and they, so there's actually a small bench, a four foot bench that's a memorial bench that was put up by the Lions on Town Hill already. And so that's the bench that we want to duplicate, but in six foot versions. And we want to replace the teak benches that are very, you know, I'd love to say, oh, we could sand them and fix them, but honestly, the, the boards are coming apart. I mean, they're not, I think if someone put it in an excessive amount of work, they might be okay for another year or two. I mean, if someone wanted to do it, but it's not, it's it's not they're never going to be a commercial bench that's really that's going to unless someone is committed to taking care of them extensively every year so we'd like to put in a, a bench that has the um the, you know the, the plastic reinforced planks and the um and it's a, a, a true commercial bench and the, have the bronze plaque for the um the stan and helen collins um, inserted in it already recreation would like to do a bench also with a bro bronze plaque for pl um, plaque for recreation and then we'd like to put it out to the community if there's anyone else that would like to provide a bench um, as a possibility uh, for you know so they can have they can have a bronze plaque of their choice recreation has um, looked at the the funds that we have and we can purchase the four benches save on the shipping 
um, so there will be four benches there. So they're not going to be two, you know, it's not going to be half done. If someone later comes to us and says, we would like to have a plaque put in, we can do that. They can't insert the plaque right into the bench that we have, but what, what happens is they come, they take the plank out, and they reinsert a new plank, that one plank, with the, with the plaque. Um, so we'd like to, you know, do the project um, with four benches now, but still we'd love to have it if, even if there's, a, if there's an organization or a person that would like a memorial bench or um, a, be a bench celebrating an event. And how much do the benches cost? Um, Roughly, I mean, it doesn't have to be About $1,300. Wow, okay. And their life, how long are they supposed to last? I mean, they look like... Uh, um, they're guaranteed, I think, for at least 10 years. I mean, there may be... Um, but they're, they're probably going to last a lot longer. There may be some... You know, there's a way to touch up the paint, right. and it's powder-coated, and if you actually use a heat gun, if there's some separation, you can do that. But they're... Um, the um, the second picture I attach, which I I don't think I sent to you originally, because I happened to be at for over Father's Day weekend. I happened to be down in um, Connecticut, and West Haven has a very long walkway um, along there the the shore, and there has to be at least a hundred, if not a hundred and fifty, of these Beautiful. benches, wow. and every one of them has a memorial plaque, and it, it's it, it's. You know, it's just, they just keep going and keep going. They have a beautiful, they, it's just, it's really lovely. And there are people using them all the time. It was a, it was a beautiful weekend, I have to say, but it's a, um, and I did look and they are by Dumore that's the same brand. And I, I, I think it's a great idea. I just, um, I have one question though. Um, sure. Uh, the one thing that popped into my mind, and it, and it speaks to what you just said you saw down in West Haven or wherever you were. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a memorial is a wonderful thing, but we can't line Town Hill with benches. It has a limited capacity. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide who gets to do it? Well, I think there are only, right, there, there are four slabs that, so we're, repl we're replacing these four benches at, gaze at the gazebo. We're not planning on replacing. We're not planning on adding any more benches. We're just replacing the four benches. But what, but what would happen if you put it out there? Mm -hmm. And you got 50 people. I think I would say first come, first serve. How do you define that? The first person that gets in touch with me. <laughs> My email check. I, I see what Jim's going with that. See, I, I, I guess it's a good problem to have. No, and, <laughs> and, and I think if that does happen, I think then we can be careful of who, you know, uh, of when the people have gotten in touch with and then decide that. Uh, my, this is my only concern with it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a fairness kind of mm -hmm. issue because I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But when you have a place like you just talked about where it can go on forever, so to speak, but you have an opportunity to keep having more and more folks mm -hmm. add on to that. When you're talking about Town Hill and you have basically four or five benches, mm -hmm. um, uh, for, uh, first come, first serve doesn't work for me because someone approaches you and says, I'd like to do this and so on, other people don't have a fair or equal opportunity to even know it's under consideration. This is the first time, if somebody's watching tonight, that it's sort of a public opportunity. Prior to that, no one knew they had an opportunity to have a memorial plaque on Town Hill. So I, I get hung up on that fairness kind of thing. Okay. So, uh, and I don't know, I don't have the answer, I've got the problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying that the, the one suggested isn't a very wonderful, worthwhile thing. I mean, it's no different than the bricks that we all put up right. there. But so everyone had an opportunity to right. buy a brick if they wanted to do okay. that. Uh, well, there's one. Sorry. The, so right, there's so two benches available, it looks like, right now. Is right. That right? right. Well, there's really, there's, there's really there's four. Well, there's four benches. There's four. There. I mean, yeah. the whole yeah, right. project. Yeah started because of the family of right. Helen and Stan right. Collins. Yep. Which is a great idea. I, I, nothing to the family. I, I think it's a wonderful idea. But I, I'm just saying, you know, Town Hill is kind of a special spot. Right. And, and um, no one else, granted, they were creative enough to come up with the idea and, and suggest it and all of that, but I just wonder how many families would love the opportunity to remember a family member or, or honor someone in their family um, that and not know that that opportunity was available to them in what is probably the most special spot, if you will, in the town. 
and I, it's, it's, it's a fairness thing. I just, I don't know the answer, but I, it just pops into my head. Is there a difference in price um, doing them one at a time as opposed to doing them all at once so that there's time for people to get educated that this opportunity does exist, will come up again, well, um, I, um, partially addresses the concern maybe. But. Yeah, uh, yes, but mostly because of shipping and mm -hmm. so the cost is reduced somewhat but that's one of the things no, the recreation commission said that we would purchase the four right. and so then if someone so, well so it would be there yeah. would be four benches there if someone wanted to put to we could that. we could go back and add the plaque right i understand that so i don't i think we would like to get the four get the four and have a com you know have a complete project we don't like we you know just yep. the idea of too old and too new or one old and one new. See, I, I'm just concerned that you, you would, you would, uh, yeah, I, do, I wouldn't want it to have the appearance of being a pick and choose kind of thing. Uh, it, it, and it, it's, it's a special thing. And, and I, I could see, I could, maybe I'm dead wrong. Maybe there aren't three people that want to do it. But I, I somehow think that there might be some families that would like to have the opportunity to create that recognition. I, I understand that. And I, I mean, I think your point is a good point. I do think that, you know, the family of, um, the Collins came to us, so I do th think that they should have a priority for having the bench. I mean, the project wouldn't have happened if they didn't even, you know, they picked up the phone and called us and got in, got in touch with, got in touch with, I think, this, your office and then our office. Um, beyond that, if there are three, be three families that want to do it, I'm sure rec the Recreation Commission, even though we were going to put a plaque on one, I think they would probably reconsider that if, in lieu of, the, of a third family. Sure. Um, we would certainly give that family a cons consideration before, before I don't us. know, am I the only one that has that concern? No, it's a good concern. I just don't, I, like I said, you, you, we, 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 you addressed a problem. We just have to come up with a, what's a good way to get the word out there and be comfortable that you know, people that wanted to do it had an opportunity to at least hear about it then. Well, I could certainly put it, you know, I can, um, even if, you know, moving forward, if we, if, you know, we, I can get the four benches and I'd certainly put it out through advertising and on Norfolk Net and such that there op there's an opportunity to do so. Um, you know, I, I think I, I am comfortable with the first person that gets, you know, people come in order or, or we can, you know, keep that, keep track of that, and then assess who's gotten in touch with us. If if everyone had an equal opportunity to be aware, mm -hmm. and you had a first come, first serve sort of process, mm -hmm. I could understand that. But when people don't have an awareness, you know, there's been no public acknowledgement that we're even considering this. Um, I think you have to give people that opportunity. And I, we couldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, I, we is. I mean, we can do that. I mean, I do think that the Collins family. Well, put the Collins family aside. Okay. Right? Just All right. put, well, put, I, put I mean, them I aside for a second. Okay. I, I mean, because they're not, it's not the issue. It's okay. just. When, when, sorry, when is your next, when is the next rec brochure go out there? Well, but rec only goes to certain groups. That goes to every home address. Don't we mail every yes. single home address? Go, well, okay. Yeah, so then there's yes, a good spot I, to do it. Yes, but, uh, you know, but uh, on, and, and I could do that but I can also put it in the paper and I can also put right it we in don't know that because the some paper, but I'm more I'm more comfortable knowing at least me personally that everyone at least got that as a postal yeah. patron they got it you know they got that I could do that as well I think that my point is that some people are more apt to open the rec brochure yeah. than others well no, but, but, but you've made that. the effort yeah. yeah I mean my point is you can't make people read things okay. I mean you know yeah. we all know right. that and that's the best besides what we talk about tonight right. if you could put it in the paper where we get the just the word out there and again, I, I, don't know when, I don't know when the next brochure goes out, but to me, that at least we know it went to every resident. It yeah. goes out at the end of August for the September. Yeah, I mean, you, the oh, again, I'm pushing the, the uh, pushing bad way to say it. I, I understand the priority of the Collins family, mm -hmm. and it's all okay. It's, but just for the remainder, I, I just that's fine. I think there should be some way of people being aware of it, so that some fairness. And, and you know, you may end up having a lottery, you know, or picking a name out of a hat or something. I mean, be a good uh, problem. Though. That, yeah, that it would yeah. be a great problem to have. And if you can yeah. talk about people if they want to put other benches, and not maybe on time, but some spots we could use benches, I'm sure. So mm -hmm. if you have more people who are willing. So. And you might want to put criteria around it. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. You know, mm -hmm. and say, you know, a long standing resident and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. 
are you comfortable with us going forward and getting the four benches and with sure. with yeah. the one from for the Collins family? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It makes sense and to get them all at one time. Japan. Yeah. And then we hopefully, like you said, we'll have a a lot of people want to do it, and then we figure out places to put more benches. Yeah, and you may you may not have anyone. You know, I I, I don't know, but yeah. at least at least the opportunity has been made available. Mm -hmm. That's that's my only concern. And if I didn't want to wait till the end of August, would I advertising the paper and putting it on Norfolk Net be okay, or would you rather wait? Well, uh, my, my, again, my stuff personally, just because I know I, again, I know that not everyone reads the back brochure. Because if you're not a kid, you might not even read it. But we do have adult programs. You do have programs. Right. So no, I, I, I just think I, I hope everyone reads it. But I not if we get the paper or a paper. I know the Sun. I don't know which paper you pick. But probably the Sun Chronicle. I, mean, I have to get it, and then the Norfolk Red Net, Net people read, but don't okay. necessarily take I, That's fine. I'm just I would, asking. I'm happy to do whatever you. Yeah would like yeah. that's fine you just take that way we can someone comes back we say listen it, was, it went out to every everybody in Norfolk got it had a chance and again yeah, okay. there might yeah. be nobody that's fine then it's then it's, it's easy then it's, it's defendable and it's okay. it's fair and okay and meanwhile if we move forward by taking the railings down and painting you're not going to put any railings up at all you're going to leave it open that's the intent it is going to stay how high up off the ground is it, it Meets building code. That's why I so had. So it's less than a foot. I, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's I'll actually. That, yes. It actually <laughs> looks like I think by memory. I think I remember it higher than it it really is. The, the old one was. Yeah. The old one was higher. higher. Yeah. That's so it. Bob Bullock and I actually yeah. went over. He went over with his tape measure and. Uh, <laughs> if if if, the, if if he says it's good, it's good. <laughs> okay. Any other Great. Thank there? you. No. Do you need a vote? I mean, or anything? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I need it. You tell me. Do I need a vote? Um, probably does, I would say, because it's under our control. No, no. All right. What's the harm? I'll take a motion then. I, I move to allow recreation to replace the four benches on Town Hill. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Have now, what about the <coughs> you have to do for the railing, too? I mean, take it down there. That's okay. a that's a building code issue to me, okay. I would okay. think. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. That's great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Nice to see you. Hey, well, right on time. Seven twenty. We're never on time. What well, happened? We're what good. happened? No, we're what happened? Time. I'm trying. I'm trying. Doug, you we want get, to? We get a new member, and my gosh, we're right on time. Yeah. See you guys. <laughs> okay, come on up. Sir. No, I, I just actually. Well, we need him. Come on up, Trip. Oh. Sit down, please. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt it. It's for, it's for people at home, not us. We can hear you, but the TV, you know, we have thousands of oh, thousands. Oh, that's what thousands. 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 My name is Trip Blair. Uh, I've been a Norfolk resident for 28 years, if you can believe it. And um, I was interested in a solar panel uh, for my home. And I contacted, I looked at a number of companies, and I contacted, eventually contacted Astrum Solar. And I, Jim and I uh, spoke, and uh, he suggested... Talking to the board, uh, Astrum Solar has got a program to deal, uh, sort of a volume discount program for towns, and and that might be something that the town of Norfolk might be interested in pursuing or looking at. Well, we've listened. That's how we and I'll, thank you. Want to join us, Doug? Uh, Doug, go ahead. Now it's all yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I had two phone solicitations for solar panels today. Uh -oh. Did you? Find I did. To come to town. It wasn't you I hung up on, was it? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> so I want to um, thank the board for inviting me to come here today. Uh, what we're going to do today is um, speak about community solar initiatives, uh, kind of in general. Uh, what I'm speaking about today is not a formal proposal. It's just more an informational uh, purpose to talk about community solar, what Astrum has done uh, with other communities, and uh, how it may benefit the uh, residents of Norfolk. Um, one thing I want to clarify uh, from the beginning is that when I use the term community solar, what I'm referring to is a group purchase initiative whereby uh, the more people in town uh, sign contracts to install solar, the lower the price is for everybody. There is something else that's referred to as community solar, 
where there's a, like a large field of solar panels and people have the opportunity to kind of like buy into a piece of it. That is not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about individuals either purchasing or leasing solar panels on their personal property. So um, I put together uh, some information. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this and uh, leave time for you guys to uh, ask questions. So our agenda, or my agenda anyway, um, there's four parts, why solar and why here, and by here I mean why Massachusetts? Is Massachusetts a good place to invest in solar? Um, talk about a little bit about what's been going on with uh, community solar uh, in our state over the course of the past few years, uh, brief chat on the economics of solar, and then open it up uh, for questions. So, you know, one of the nice things about uh, solar energy is ex it's extremely plentiful and the energy itself is free and it's local. So that differentiates solar energy from uh, any other type of energy that we use for electricity, primarily in Massachusetts, natural gas or coal or oil. Uh, that is a finite resource, it costs a lot of money, and we don't make any of it, so we have to bring it in from somewhere else. So uh, these are just a couple of statistics. Every 88 minutes, enough sunlight reaches the Earth's surface to power the world for an entire year. And every 112 minutes, more energy from sun uh, reaches the Earth's surface than is stored in all the proven oil, coal, and natural gas reserves in the world. So no doubt it's plentiful. The next uh, slide is... Uh, just kind of like a little graphical representation of the amount of solar energy that reaches the earth every year, um, which is 23,000 terawatt years. Um, if you want to kind of think about a terawatt year, what we think of typically are kilowatt hours when we uh, pay our electric bills. So the world uses 16 terawatt years per year. Um, and the sun generates 23,000 terawatt years per year. And you can see how that compares with all of the other sources of fuel that we typically use, such as natural gas, uh, petroleum, uh, nuclear, coal, and so forth. In 2013, 29% of all new electricity generating capacity that was built in the United States was solar which is a massive percentage and it's almost a tripling from the previous year where 10 percent of new solar capacity that came on uh, new electricity generating capacity was from solar. In Q1 of 2014, 74 percent of all new electricity generating capacity in this country came from solar. So that I think speaks to a, a lot of things. First of all, there aren't a lot of coal-fired plants being built or oil-fired plants being built or nuclear plants being built. So a lot, most of the new stuff that's coming online is using alternative energy sources, but uh, it does speak to the fact that uh, solar is um, being adopted quite rapidly in the United States right now. The next slide is just a, a graphical representation of how much does the sun shine in various areas of uh, the United States, and you can see that Massachusetts gets a good amount of sunshine. It's about 90% of what shines in Florida. So everyone typically asks the question, do we get enough sun in Massachusetts for solar to uh, make sense? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. Um, I have this uh, little insert of Germany on uh, the slide because Germany leads the world in solar installations and you can see where they fit on the map, just a little bit worse than Alaska. And the reason why Germany leads the world in solar installations, even though the sun doesn't shine very much there, is because of the incentives that they have in place for their residents to install. And Massachusetts happens to have a tremendous incentive regime in place, which makes it uh, extraordinarily economically feasible for individuals to purchase or lease solar. So prices have been coming down over the course of the last several years. Um, you know, in 2002, uh, solar prices were somewhere north of $12 per watt. 
Um, if Norfolk were to do a, a community purchase initiative, uh, the prices that your residents would pay would be something below $4 per watt. So you can see over time as electric, uh, solar installation prices have come down, the number of installations in the state have increased substantially. So where do we stand nationally as it relates to solar? So in 2013, Massachusetts installed a little bit less than 250 megawatts of solar, placing us fourth in the country uh, behind California, Arizona, and North Carolina. 100% um, of the new electricity generating capacity that came online in Massachusetts last year was from solar. Moving along, uh, this slide shows how much solar the little yellow dots were in Massachusetts uh, in 2006. And you move to the next slide, you can see how the adoption rate has grown pretty much exponentially uh, over the past several years. And the reason for that is a combination of incentives, which we'll talk about in a moment, and declining solar prices. So uh, the state of Massachusetts introduced uh, a program called Solarize Mass. In uh, 2011, they did a pilot program, and that's really the model for community uh, solar uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, I think there were four communities that participated in 2011. It was a substantial success. So they've continued the program since in 2012, 2013, and now in 2014. Um, if uh, Norfolk were interested, it could go through the Solarize process where you apply to the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center um, to uh, participate in the program. They review a number of applications every year. Um, I think you have to qualify as a green community. Um, and you have to be doing other uh, energy and conservation efforts in order to be qualified as a green community. But if you're selected as a solarized community, this, uh, what we're talking about now, happens. Um, you're not required to uh, participate in the solarized program to have a community solar initiative. Uh, you can do it privately, if you like, in a number of uh, towns uh, that we've worked with in the past and are working with presently have done so. I guess the advantage of, um, of doing it privately is that um, you get to select the timing yourself um, and you have a little bit more flexibility and control over the program than if you go through uh, the uh, Mass uh, Clean Energy Center. Either way is great. Um, I don't necessarily uh, recommend one over the other, although doing it privately is a lot faster and a lot easier. So as a company, uh, we've been uh, intimately involved with community solar since uh, the state started the program. Uh, we were selected by six communities in uh, 2012 uh, for the first full scale, full scale solarized program. Um, since that time, we've done community solar in a total of 12 uh, different Massachusetts communities. And we've contracted for more solar through community solar than any solar contractor in the state. Um, included in the initiatives that we led uh, was one uh, in Concord. It's called the Concord Solar Challenge. That was a private community uh, group solar purchase initiative. And uh, that was by far the most successful uh, group purchase initiative that uh, uh, the state has ever seen. Uh, 171 systems were contracted for over a several month period, uh, totaling about 1.5 megawatts of power. Um, so after the Concord Solar Challenge, there were about 200 solar installations on residences in Concord. Beforehand, there were about 20. So in community solar, um, Astrum has contracted for about 700 systems since 2012 uh, with a combined capacity of about 5 megawatts of power. Now, I, I guess just saying that doesn't mean all that much. It's a lot. Um, we have a department in our company that's exclusively dedicated to uh, community solar initiatives. Um, 
uh, if the town decides to do a program and if you decide to do it with Astrum, we support the program uh, with a full uh, marketing, uh, informational and outreach effort. Uh, that marketing effort uh, typically consists of uh, advertising, direct mail, uh, things of that nature, flyers, posters, banners. Um, as far as uh, informational, we'll uh, conduct open houses and uh, uh, town information session at the kickoff. Um, uh, everybody in town um, that lives in a single family home um, that's over the age of 18 will be notified that the program's taking place and invited to come to that informational session um, through uh, direct mail uh, postcard. Um, typically, the key to success of a community solar initiative is that you have uh, key members of the community kind of acting as solar ambassadors. Some towns call them solar coaches. It's really the liaison between the town and the contractor, and Astrum will train uh, those key people as to you know, how to go about making the program uh, as successful it can as it can possibly be. Uh, in addition, all of the solar coaches or ambassadors uh, will be provided with an online portal where they can keep track of uh, people who have signed up for the program, where they stand uh, in the process, whether their home has been evaluated yet, whether they've had a consultation, and if so, what decision did they make, yes or no. If they decided no, what was the reason? And uh, that's updated in real time. In addition, there'll be a website created um, for the program that we branded with whatever name uh, the town chooses, you know, the Norfolk Solar Initiative or whatever you want to call it, uh, co-branded with Astrum and the town, um, which makes for uh, kind of a seamless uh, sign-up process. So what's the big deal about community solar? Why are so many communities doing it? What's the advantage? And the main advantage is, uh, is that it costs a lot less. So, you know, this little graphic describes kind of the cost stack that, you know, uh, basically comprises the cost of any product. Um, through uh, economies of scale, we're able to compress that stack. Um, we're able to eliminate uh, most of our client acquisition costs out of our pricing model because when you do a program like this it's kind of a captive audience. So um, people who sign up for a site evaluation aren't going to be doing so because they responded to our uh, typical marketing. They're going to do so because they live in this town. So typically the discount uh, that's afforded to uh, folks in a community program is you know, around 30 or 40 percent off of typical uh, pricing. In addition to that, um, it really simplifies the process of going solar. Um, it reduces the time to contract. I know we all know people who will take four years to buy a refrigerator, you know, because they have to do all the research. The nice thing about a program like this is that the at the town level, most of the due diligence has, due diligence has been done in advance, um, and the town has put its stamp of approval on the program so that when one of our consultants comes into the home, um, uh, the, you know, the, the resident is going to know that we've already been looked at and we've been vetted by a committee of town members that ultimately selected us or whoever. Um, you select. So the economics of solar um, are phenomenal uh, in Massachusetts. So anyone who purchases uh, solar panels in our state receives a 30% federal tax credit. Whatever the cost of the system is, the federal government kicks in 30%. That's an unlimited credit. There's no cap on it and there's no income limitations or anything like that, so everybody qualifies. In addition, the state of Massachusetts will provide a $1,000 tax credit on their state tax return. Uh, the state also provides a rebate. Typical rebate would be about $1,250, uh, but it is possible uh, under certain circumstances to get rebates up to $3,250. Um, net metering uh, basically means that it doesn't matter when you produce the energy, 
you can use it whenever you need it. So if at any given time you produce more than you need, that excess goes out to the grid. Uh, NSTAR uh, credits you for putting that energy on the grid at the full retail cost of electricity so that when you take that energy off the grid, it's already paid for. Uh, finally, uh, solar renewable energy credits are really one of the uh, key drivers of solar adoption in Massachusetts. Uh, people who own solar systems in, uh, in our state get paid for generating solar power above and beyond the value of the electricity that they're generating. So it's kind of a double dip. So you generate solar power, uh, 1,000 kilowatt hours of solar energy. Uh, NSTAR charges about 18 cents per kilowatt hour. So you save that money by not having to buy that energy from NSTAR. Uh, and then in addition to that, you get paid about $250. What you're getting paid for uh, um, with SREX is really the environmental benefit that you're generating through the production of um, solar energy. Uh, we could spend an entire meeting talking about those SRECs. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about them. Um, in a community solar initiative, typical payback, payback on a system is about five years. Um, and if measured over a 20-year uh, term, which is our typical uh, warranty uh, time, uh, calculates out to a rate of return of about 17% annually, which is uh, pretty uh, compelling from an economic perspective. Um, if someone uh, can't afford the initial capital outlay for a system, they can lease. Uh, leasing a system typically involves zero capital outlay. The system owner, which would be a third-party leasing company, uh, receives the tax incentives and the SREX. Uh, and what the resident gets is uh, reduced power costs. Um, typical savings, 20 to 30 percent off of uh, what they are currently paying for electricity, but they also have the opportunity to fix that cost with the solar lease so that as electricity prices rise over time, <coughs> the cost of the solar lease does not, therefore saving them increasing amounts of money over the years. So. Questions? Uh, just a question in terms of uh, maintenance and, uh, you know, history at this point in terms of these uh, solar units, rooftop units. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that? I know there's been some changes in technology, too, so, you know, a lot has happened. Maybe you could just update us on that aspect of it. So, um, solar panels, generally speaking, are uh, maintenance-free. They originally the original application when they were first developed was to go into space and power satellites. So the idea is they just work on their own. They're not machines. It's just silicon crystal pressed between two layers of tempered glass. Um, so there really isn't any maintenance per se on the solar panels themselves. You don't have to clean them in rains or snows quite enough to keep them clean enough. Um, there's another component of a, of a system called an inverter which solar panels generate DC electric, our homes use AC. So this inverter converts the power from DC to AC. Uh, the inverters that uh, we would propose uh, if we did a program uh, for Norfolk would be uh, what are called microinverters, which means that um, they're solid state instruments. So those also are not machines, no moving parts. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, our installations would, for the most part, be maintenance-free. However, uh, they would be covered by warranty for an extensive period of time, 10 or 20 years. That would be the resident's choice. Um, and if so, if something did go wrong during the warranty period, whatever was defective or malfunction would be replaced or repaired at no cost. Yeah, I see you're out of Hopkinton and you have pine trees like we have in our town. So there's constantly things falling from the sky, and not an issue? Uh, it doesn't tend to accumulate on these units and around um, these units? No, not really. Um, I mean, the idea is if you've got tall pine trees surrounding your house, chances are it's not going to be a good place to put solar panels anyway. From a shade perspective, um, 
if they're uh, you know far enough away, you know hopefully you know you'll get needles, but mm -hmm. not too much of the um, pine tar. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't seen any significant uh, problems from pine trees. Um, let me see if I can and recap. Uh, basically, what you're looking to do mm -hmm. is community will endorse you. Um, and the expectation is is that we've done our due diligence to recommend to our residents that you are one of the best, that your pricing is below market, uh, your service is superior, you know, all of the things that, that one would expect. There are other firms, I assume, that do this. Is, are you, you, you're not unique, You're not the only one. Okay. And I would assume that you, you know we have bidding rules associated with communities, so I'm assuming you've gone through that process with other towns? Um, I don't think it's been so much of a bidding process as it's been um, a, an RFP process. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that uh, the lowest price you know, wins, um, but the best value typically does. No, I would, we have I would gone agree. through an RFP process. Okay. Um, uh, that's uh, part and parcel of the Solarize program. Um, and when we've done this privately with communities, um, there's been some sort of formal selection mm -hmm. process that was competitive. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't necessarily a bidding process. Well, I, you, you said it more correctly than I did. Yep. Um, what, what, does a tip, what would a typical 3,500 square foot home family of four cost someone to install a system like this? So, um, I'll answer the, the question a little bit differently because some 35 square foot family of four homes have roof structures that are very different than others, but the average system size is about eight kilowatts. And an eight kilowatt system um, with good solar exposure will generate somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. So um, 10,000 kilowatt hours of electricity if you're an NSTAR customer is $1,800 a year. Um, and I guess that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 a month. Mm -hmm. So if that were the typical family of fours electricity consumption, that system um, uh, before factoring in uh, tax incentives, be somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty thousand dollars to purchase. Um, federal go if if the price were thirty thousand exactly, the federal government would kick in nine thousand, the state government would kick in a thousand in the form of a state tax credit, and if the solar exposure were good, they're going to get another twelve hundred and fifty dollars from the state. So. Um, know, $19,000. After all rebates. Right. Um, but then if you figure that on that system, if it's generating 10,000 kilowatt hours of energy annually, you're going to get $1,800 worth of electricity at current prices. And at current SREC prices, about $2,500 more of revenue from the sale of your solar credits. So 2500 and 1800 is $4,300 a year of financial benefit on that $19,000 system. So about five years. It's a little bit less than five-year payback. And over the full 20-year warranty period, you're talking about a profit or an economic benefit in the tens of thousands of dollars. So from a, just viewing it, as if it were an investment that you were evaluating like you would evaluate a mutual fund or a bond or a stock, the risk reward is far superior on solar because the return on a solar array depends on whether or not the sun comes up. Um. Okay. Uh, one, one more question on the economics of this. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a lease. For individuals, what's, what is the, uh, what's the ratio of lease to savings? If there's no capital outlay, if the twenty, if if the 
20 grand is not spent by the individual homeowner and they're leasing it and they're getting an equivalent $150 savings per month, what's the trade in terms of the lease? So the price of a lease depends upon how good the solar exposure is. Take the same example. Sa same example, that lease would probably be around $100 a month. So it's three times the rate of return, Th three times long. So it's a 15 year break even front of lease. No, it, it's an immediate break even. There's no capital outlay, and they're getting $150 worth of electricity now for 100. But so they're, they're saving. But they're, but they're paying, they're paying a rental fee for that. For how long? In lieu of paying 100, they're paying a $100 lease fee in lieu of a $150 electric bill. So that first month. So the lease is less than the savings of the electricity. The cost of the lease is less than the value of the electricity that the lease is producing. And why wouldn't anyone, then why wouldn't everyone do that? That's a good question. Why, why would you lay out $20,000 of capital if in fact your return is an immediate savings on a lease? Why would you do that? So um, the economic benefit of owning the system is better than the economic benefit of leasing a system. Even with the use of money consideration? Yes. Um, if, you, if you look at, if you look at uh, like a 20-year cash flow analysis, the system that we we're talking about hypothetically, like maybe over that 20-year period, you'll profit if you own it by, let's say, and I'm just making up a number, $50,000. On the lease, you may save $30,000. But you've got the use of capital, which if you you've got a 7% return, you double in 10 years. Right. It, but under the purchase, you're earning, in that example, probably 18 to 20% on your money, So, which is a favorable alternative to investing your money at 7%. But you make a very good point um, that the lease is very attractive. As an investment, Owning is preferable. Um, from a rate of return perspective, leasing is preferable because with no capital outlay, any return is infinite. Okay. Right? Yeah. So um, it's an interesting comparison. Yeah. I, I, I think that generally speaking, our experience has been that um, folks who have it in the budget to purchase tend to purchase and everybody else leases. There are certain reasons why someone might lease um, as opposed to purchase, for instance, if they cannot benefit from the tax credit for whatever reason. That's a very big part of the purchase economics. Mm -hmm. A third, yeah. Right. So, um, but the nice thing about um, Astrum and about uh, when we uh, lead uh, community solar initiatives is that we present both. Um, most companies do one or the other. Mm -hmm. And um, we're completely agnostic as to whether someone purchases a system or leases a system. Um, if they purchase, we're selling a system to them. If they lease, we're selling a system to the leasing company. It really doesn't matter to us. Do you just have one leasing company? Do you have a bunch that you work with, or is it just one dominant? Um, we work with a couple of leasing companies. Um, the economics work out there. We have um, we operate in 13 states, and the incentives vary from state to state. And the way the leases are structured, one leasing company might have better pricing in one state versus the other. So we just figure out what's going to offer the best deal to the customer, and that's what we offer. Typically, our leasing companies are very large you know, multi-billion dollar financial institutions or utilities. What, what, some, what are some of the local communities that have adopted your program? Uh, so right now we're just um, completing uh, Solarize initiatives in Needham and Andover and Lexington and Bedford. Um, we're also doing a private initiative in Wellesley. Previously we've done 
uh, a private program in Concord. What, what distinguish? What is a private program? So, um, some communities have their own utilities, mm -hmm. uh, municipal utilities, right. and those communities are not eligible. Okay. To yeah, got participate it, got in solar yep, got it. So their only option is to do privately. Um, we also uh, were the installer for uh, Wayland, uh, Sudbury, Lincoln. Uh, Pittsfield, Lenox, and Palmer. I think that's 12. In the case of the uh, lease situation, how does it work uh, when there's a transfer, there's a sale of, of the home? So the lease is a 20 year term. I think you asked that mm -hmm. prior and I didn't answer. Um, the lease is assignable. What happens after 20 years? So, um, d d did I fully answer your question? Yeah. Okay, it, yeah. It, it's completely assignable. Okay. Um, so, at the end of the lease term, the um, lessee has a number of options. They can extend the lease for another 10 years if they want to. They can buy out the system at a price that was uh, predetermined in the original lease contract. Um, they can say, I'm through with solar, and demand that the lease company come and remove the equipment from their house, um, or they can do nothing. Do nothing? They can do absolutely nothing if they want. What the contract says, if they do nothing, is they must make available the system to the leasing company to come retrieve should they desire to do so. My personal feeling is the chances of a leasing company wanting to do that would be between slim and none, and slim is like a far second. Why is that? Because you've probably got out of date. Probably out of date. Yeah. That is has no market value, mm -hmm. yeah, do but it. would cost thousands of dollars to retrieve. So my feeling, just from a business perspective, is that leasing companies would go out of business if they went out and started taking equipment off of houses at the end of lease terms. There's no financial benefit whatsoever and a pretty significant cost. So m my expectation is that at the end of a lease term, the leasing company is most likely to just abandon the equipment. And by virtue of that abandonment, the homeowner would then own the equipment. And at that time, if there was something wrong or it needed to be removed, it would be the responsibility of the homeowner to do that. So the equipment itself carries 25-year uh, warranties. So it, and that's inclusive in the lease? Yes. So the guarantees and warranties don't change between lease and purchase? They're a little bit different, but they're essentially the same. But the equipment is warrantied by the manufacturer. So that's kind of like outside of the lease. Mm -hmm. When, if the leasing company owns the equipment, they are the beneficiary of that warranty. But if the homeowner owns the equipment, then they are the beneficiary of that warranty. It goes with whoever owns the equipment. So if after 20 years the homeowner owns the equipment, they still have five years of warranty protection on the inverters and on the panels. But if you're leasing, you never own the equipment. Until the leasing company abandons it. Okay. Right? Technically. I mean, not, not, <laughs> I we, 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 don't, we don't know, but yeah, yeah. that would be the uh, business, this wise business move. Right. But, so, okay. yeah, I mean, I'm not saying they're definitely going to abandon it, but I think that's the most likely outcome. So there's uh, no, no cost to the town? That is correct. Um, well, we have an energy committee we do. Um, that I, I think it would make sense for, I mean, it's certainly worthy of consideration. Why not? I mean, if it provides our, our residents a benefit, but there is a due diligence process. So um, why don't we uh, ask you to engage our energy committee and we'll ask them in turn to uh, RFP this and take a look at all of the different competitive situations. And it, it sounds like something that I'm still a little puzzled why someone would buy it and not lease it, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, One which I'm happy to have with you, but okay. if you like. Can I make a couple comments? Sure. You, you need a microphone, you, I don't want a microphone. You have, you to, have to. You have, you have to. Because people are at home. It's come for up, home. Uh, well, you can repeat it. No. No. Can, come, come on. Come up? Uh, it, it's, for the, it's for the audience at home. I understand. I think we want to make you a TV star, Trevor. Oh, I'm not a TV star. So I've looked at this for about a year. Uh, I l looked at Astrum. I looked at a couple of other 
uh, vendors, there's a couple of things in terms of urgency. There's a thing called an investment tax credit, which is where you get your federal tax. That expires at the end of 2016. So there's, so that's end of 2000. That's two and a half years from now, right? So if we want to get the town engaged in this, that's a, that's something to, to, to consider. Number two, I like distributed energy because you don't have to put up power lines as as the town expands or our electrical usage expands. It's all it's self-contained on the property. So the the fact that you don't have to put additional transmission lines up um, is, in my humble opinion, the right way to go. I, I don't, the new poles are much, much taller uh, <laughs> than the old poles. So it detracts from trying to make the town a little bit more uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I would agree. Those are my two, just two comments. Yeah. We, 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 but we're, we're, we have an obligation to do due diligence on Of course. It. And, and so, but I, it's not something that takes forever. And I would welcome yeah. to be part of that committee if, if you're looking for volunteers. Okay. We're always looking for volunteers. I know. Any other committee you should like to volunteer no. for while you're here? No. No, no thank you. <laughs> I have a whole list of vacancies. Just, just yeah. happen to have a list here. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Marion has an uh, electronic copy okay. of okay. this. Thank you. Um, if any of you want one, I'm sure she'd be happy to forward it to you. And my contact information uh, is in your folders. So okay. thanks thank for Thank you time. for bringing it to our attention. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. welcome. Thank uh, you. And, uh, we will definitely pursue it. And well, I um, shouldn't say, I don't mean to speak yeah. for the board, but I mean, I, I would certainly favor pursuing mm -hmm. it. And um, how will I get in contact with a representative from the Energy Committee? Marion, can you arrange that for us? Can you give me Andy's name and phone tomorrow? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, thank you both. Here. Yep. A little ahead of schedule. <clears throat> it's an interesting idea. Um, well, we talked about it before, I thought. Or Rob talked about it with Solarized Mass. Or, he know, did. Different ones yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, if you want we, we can't start that. Got my we're not going to start that any twenty. So why don't we move on then? Because we're, we're ahead of schedule for the Highland League. Got my so. curiosity. I'm going to run the numbers. Uh, <laughs> I figured you would leave. Can we do the um, the let's approve the surge contract awards for DPW Loom? Everyone have a chance to look yes, at Yes, I did. Yep. Any questions, Jeffrey? No. Make a motion. I move to approve the surge contract awards for the DP ET Wow. DPW commencing July 1st, 2014 for DTW supplies, loom, precast concrete manholes and catch basins, permanent bituminous concrete patching mix in class one bituminous concrete patching mix per the surge sheet attached. That is a mouthful. A second. second. Any other discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we got the directional sign permits. We have uh, four directional sign permits, right? For Dana Paul's Farm, Four Kicks, and uh, Norfolk Rink. Yep. Okay. Uh, motion for that. So moved. Second. 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 All right. Any questions, comments? Right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have, we're running past that. We got the, um, do you want, uh, they want to do the, man, you gave us a list of the, um, of the Norfolk Rink management signs. But that was all. No, they're, they're all together. They're all put together. them all together. They're put them all together. Yeah. Okay. All, that's all set there. Is there any, Marion? Are there any there that are different than what we've done? Nope. Okay. We just read them. I did notice they had different fees. Is it? Is there a reason for that, Marion? Do you know? Different fees. Because they have how many signs they have? Okay. Five dollars a sign. Oh, five dollars a sign. Okay. Makes sense. Do you want to do reappointments? Yeah, we can do reappointments, right? We okay. We have to move each one, so we have a list. Okay. Did you see this one, the one I just gave you tonight? Did you get Is it different than the one you emailed? Yeah. Okay, well done. No. It's in our bag. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Let's see. Not by a lot, just I think Ray's on something. Okay. Don't, haven't heard back. Blue, don't want to reappoint. Is it the one you sent late email on? No, we have just got to. We just got it in the packet, though, right? Okay. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I will move to appoint David Rosenberg to the Board of Registrars for a three-year term. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will move to appoint uh, Cindy Andrade as a representative from Precinct 3 to the Community Preservation Committee for a three-year term. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I move to appoint Daniel Crofton and Joyce Terrio to a three-year term on the Conservation Board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. I move to appoint Kevin Roach and Gail Anderson to the Corrections Advisory Committee one-year term. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I move to appoint Charlotte Howard, Jason Talleman, and Charlotte Fishner to the Council on Aging three-year terms. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I move to appoint Richard Todoldi, I hope I pronounced that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, to a three-year term for the Cultural Council. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I'd like to hold on that next committee for a little bit, if you don't mind, because okay. that's joint with the planning board. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Is that agreeable? Fine with me, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I move to appoint Andy Bakanowski to the Energy Committee, three-year term. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I move to appoint Geraldine Tasker to the Historical Commission, three-year term. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I move to appoint Scott Bragdon, Neil Cross, and James Dwyer to the Insurance Advisory Committee, one-year term. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I move to appoint May, uh, Ray Goff, our planner, uh, to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, three-year term, replacing Mr. Hathaway. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Jeff, why don't you do the next group? Okay, I move to appoint uh, the following individuals to a two-year term with the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, Thomas Cleverton, William Conklin, Scott Dittrich, James Lehan, and Sandra Smith. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I recuse myself. Okay. Like mm -hmm. County Advisory Board. Uh, okay. I move to appoint Jack, J John J. McFeely for a three-year term to the Norfolk County Advisory Board. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Right. Uh, Next one we should wait to we'll wait on the yeah. Nick Planning Board. And for the, I move that we appoint Robert Nicodemus for a one-year term to the Southwest Area Planning. Second. All in, oh, all in favor say aye. 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 Do we, on the town council, do we have to... We do have to appoint it every year. Yeah, baby, we don't, we don't put off a bid or anything. Be just gonna, I don't know, I'd like to check. Okay, we'll hold on that. All right, um, I move to appoint William Conklin for one year term to the, as a veteran agent. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Zoning Board of Appeals, um, these are all, I, uh, one five year, I uh, move to appoint Joseph Sabatino for a five year term to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I move to appoint Jason Vanderpool and Donald Hansen to a uh, associate one year uh, term. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I move to appoint uh, to the Zoning Bylaws Study Committee. No, that's December. You're right. You're right. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. All right. And then we have. Oh, it's still early. Uh, we do have to act on Mr. Diamond. Yes. Why? Is it, I got that from Aaron, so I'm, it's my first time I've seen, not seen that. Um. Um, we recently appointed a uh, zoning working committee to deal with two major projects that are before the, commu before the community. Um, one of the members, uh, Mr. Diamond, uh, does have a financial interest uh, as it relates to anything that would be in the outer B1 district down towards the old town hall as he has family that owns property there. So therefore he has to disclose that and um, he has done so and would have to recuse himself from any uh, discussions or votes associated with that particular Peace. area of the community should that be an area of discussion as it relates to this new committee. And he has so disclosed it. Okay. And we have to uh, vote to accept that disclosure. Okay. Mary, was Peter coming in tonight, or I mean, he, no? Okay. All right. Well, Jeffrey, do you have any questions, Jeff? 
Page to three day now, okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna look here. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's uh, strictly related to the uh, the B1. Yep. Yep. He is he is actually requesting a, a, a formal um, opinion from us on that, and uh, I would ask that the board inform him that uh, he must recuse himself from any discussions uh, associated with the lower B1 district as it relates to rezoning considerations. And reading this, it looks like it, you know, the exclusion is the entire B1, correct? Am I reading this correctly? The B1 core as well as the lower B1. I don't, I don't think it differentiates, which uh, is fine. Well, which his, is fine. his only financial interest would be as it relates to the lower B1 district. Um, I can't see where there'd be any conflict with the core. Not in a butter. He has no family member that's in a butter. Um, not even close. But he does have, there is an indirect financial interest associated with the lower B1. So I, my recommendation would be that we advise him that he must recuse himself from any discussions or vote, well, obviously votes, but uh, any discussions associated with the lower B1 district as it relates to that committee, which may or may not even mm -hmm. be, you know, something they address. But should that be the case, he needs to recuse himself. And do we, can we add that under our determination and our yeah. comments section? Yep. Yep. Marion, you get put mm -hmm. that in there? Yep. Lower B1, okay. Thank you. Second that. Okay. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we all need to sign there or just one? Uh, just you. Just me. Great. Just me. Yeah, why don't you want me to sign this one, Marion? Does it matter? Okay. How about, uh, do we see approved minutes? Uh, yep. Finding anything tonight, that's not a good sign. Oh. Did you take my agenda? I didn't take yours, then I got this one. Well, I, I usually take that. yours. Can I go? Yeah, you can, yeah, sure. Oh, the oh, you want, yeah. So it's right there. I mean, Thank you. Sir. I move to accept the uh, March 18th, 2014 regular and executive session minutes, April 2nd, 2014. Uh -huh. Uh, May 1st, 2014, May 13th, 2014, and May 28th, 2014. I reviewed them, and they're fine. Second. Yeah, for some of those, I, I probably well, actually, need to Well, actually, May 28th would be yours. Yeah, that's probably the only one. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I did review so, them anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll second. I'll, your, I'll, rec your, I'll, I'll go back yeah, to you. Yeah. I'll stop after May 1st, and you're <laughs> okay. on from there. How's that? Yeah, yeah. what you guys did you before be the, I got here, be I take no now. responsibility. Let me rephrase that. I move to accept the minutes as of March 18th, 2014, regular and executive session. I move to accept the minutes as of the April 2nd, 2014, and May 1st, 2014, regular session. No. Okay, I second it. Any other questions? Jeff can't vote, I believe that. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Your turn. You get to move. You have to move. I get to move. You give me the piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not <laughs> on the agenda tonight. I'm a mind reader here. Uh, okay. Um, I uh, move to accept the minutes of the Board of Selectmen meeting on May May 13th, 2014, and May 28th, 2014. Second. My apologies for encroaching on your job. <laughs> you apologies <laughs> accepted. Thank you. End of discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, still <clears throat> ahead of time, Mary. You said we are expecting more people, so it's only 8-12. Uh, let's see. Did Jack do anything, Mary, that he wanted to do to report for? Uh, well, there's one thing I can update you on, if you'd okay. like. Um, that I think folks will find interesting. Um, you may remember in town meeting we voted a um, certain number for King Philip. Mm -hmm. um, that number was not supported by other towns. Um, and um, so our appropriation is actually, uh, if I, and I'm, I'm going by memory here, but I believe our appropriation is in the neighborhood of $100,000. Am I close, Marion? Pretty close to that. Mm -hmm. About $100,000. We voted in excess of what we will actually end up paying. Um, so, uh, and apparently King Philip is comfortable with that. They put some E&D money, excess and deficiency funds, which is like our free cash, mm -hmm. 
to supplement the budget, and they had some other sources of income. So they have made up the difference. Uh, but we voted a higher number than has been supported by the other communities. So therefore, um, it will flow into free cash because our appropriation will uh, be less than what we anticipated. So uh, when they get certified, our number will be about $100,000 less. So when I had heard that the number was lower, I didn't necessarily relate that to the actions of any of the other towns in the district. I thought that it was just related to, you know, the final accounting, if you will. Yeah. But now, since that point in time, I guess there's some additional learning that it has to be. It was kind of a combination of the two. You know, I, I mean, I don't know who, I'm not sure who opened the door first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, what, but um, Plainville did vote a different number. Um, and, and Rentham subsequently supported that number. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if it uh, was facilitated by sort of a discussion with the additional resources of sources of funds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, which is fine. I, I mean, they're, they're whole. They feel mm -hmm. comfortable with where they are, and we have $100,000 worth of free cash that will flow into mm -hmm. our system in, you know, once we certify that in October. Um, the important thing is, is that you know, the school got what it needs. That's, that's the important yeah. thing. Uh, so I, I'm not sure quite how that all happened. Yeah. 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 That's it, I think. That's all I'm. That's all you're good for? One of you can sign those appointments. Oh, okay. Doesn't matter whether it's a clerk or a chair. All these? <laughs> you want to split them up? <laughs> all three of them? Yeah, split them up. If you want, you can. If you want, you can like signing? Sure. Okay. Pass them around. Good people. <laughs> Just don't give me mine. I was going to say you can pass it back if I did it. I didn't look. Um, they yeah, we have to make sure they get sworn in, right, Mary? I know it was a yeah, the issue. Yeah, we Please get, come and get sworn in. Didn't get sworn in at all last year. Our first meeting uh, of the Zoning Working Committee I thought was really very productive. Um, we. Um, had some very lively discussion about some of the issues with Southwood and uh, Lawrence Street. Um, and there's been a follow-up meeting on Lawrence Street that um, there's a new proposal coming forward, which we haven't formally received yet, but informally, um, pretty big. Has Mr. Vallone responded to the email that uh, he Ray has? He has. A meeting is set for um, July 2nd. Well, there's there's two meetings. It, there, there's there's a kind of a one-on-one -on -one to, to go over the process uh, with them, um, which I think is Jack and I, and then it's the seventh Monday, the seventh. And then is the, the, the seventh with, is uh, the is the working committee George meeting. Malone. Okay. Right. So he didn't necessarily provide any additional perspective as of yet no um, more he, just he committing not. to the, the date if you will for but the that's the purpose of the meeting on the second yeah that's, that's fine I know Ray said the yeah. sooner that we right. get Ray, information yeah, Ray, so Ray asked him in the email to send some information you know, get aligned with him um, does it matter what order man? No. but the, the, the um, additional opportunity um, over on Lawrence Street is is um, taken on a larger perspective at least the proposed project is pretty substantial and it comes with a ton of issues um, uh, you know, water not being the least significant issue uh, but this is this is going to be an interesting conversation <laughs> I can move no. the clock up three, three minutes if you want. I don't know. Marion, these are great classes. Thanks. Glad you can see because I couldn't. <laughs> okay, well, I got 8.17, so Good three minutes. No, three minutes. Sorry. Thank you.
You could you could start. It's not a public hearing. Oh, is that one? Okay. No. It's yeah, not so a public hearing. Right. So you're not you're not restricted right. to that. I have eight seventeen, so we have probably most We're of We're good to go. And who's gonna um, so who's gonna lead us? Is it Miss Barthelma, are you gonna I'll call Oh Mr. Terra, would you mind coming up? Hello. Actually hey, wel welcome both. We don't need a microphone. Paul, how are you? I'm fine. Good. Good. Good Hi, Paul. Barbara, how are you tonight? So I uh, just to kind of get us to where we are at. Uh, did you all uh, get a copy? Okay, okay, you got to them. So, so just to kind of bring you up to speed, uh, last spring um, we put together an initiative to study the control of the dam on the upstream side, uh, and we um, hired Pair Corporation. Uh, they're out of Rhode Island, but they have an office in uh, Foxborough. Um, they did an estimation of costs on uh, constructing dam alternatives on the upstream okay. side. And um, is so. That, is that an official designation? That is, a, yeah. <laughs> All I can think of is the Chevy Chase summer vacation. Got it. The dam <laughs> tour. You know. uh, so uh, they put together some uh, cost alternatives for us to consider. And uh, that's what you got uh, as this copy here. Um, this project kind of got sidelined as a result of other activities that we got swept up with. Uh, recently, there was some water level issues with Highland Lake. Um, our initial intent uh, to control the, uh, the dam or to look at dam alternatives was to um, uh, control the water levels. Uh, Look at the uh, eliminate the uh, uh, um, current maintenance uh, that's that that's taken place, uh, and open up the lake to more uh, recreational purposes for which uh, you know our initial purchase was meant for. Um, in our research uh, and in our discussions, uh, we've come to find out that there's a question of ownership of the property, um, and so. There's four alter there's four uh, solutions that um, that Pair Corporation put together. Uh, all of them are on the upstream side. Uh, the least expensive was kind of like a sluice gate type of contraption. Um, I don't know if you, uh, have you ever y'all been down to mm -hmm. Island Lake? You, you know, there's two tunnels under the railroad tracks and mm -hmm. goes on to the other side, and there's some control mechanisms on the other side. Uh, all of what this uh, report um, is about is on the upstream side. And um, the condition of the dam as it sits today, it's considered to be in poor shape. However, uh, that's a relative term. There's not a high threat uh, or a high degree uh, of threat with regards if the dam should um, breach. Uh, the state's been out the property owner, the, Mr. Roach, who uh, says he uh, possibly owns the property, has had the dam examined in accordance to the state regulations. Uh, the state said that uh, the uh, dam, if it should breach, uh, there's a very, very low threat of property damage associated with it. Um, so uh, when we spoke about the uh, alternatives, the last alternative, which isn't on here, was why don't we buy the dam? All right. And that's actually where Barbara came up. You were involved with, in the course of uh, the development of the park area, uh, she was involved with ownership issues, and, and that's how we came to find out that quite possibly the state owns the property. It goes deeper than that. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. I, I, was research, I have been researching Highland Lake since the uh, about 2005. I was involved in a joint project with the Walpole Historical, and we produced a small booklet about the history down there, and that's what that, uh, led me on the path. And in trying to straighten it all out, I finally solved the puzzle and figured out the chain of command or the chain of title on the ownership of the dam from 1825 down to present day. And I believe I included a chart in your packet mm -hmm that shows precisely that. 
before I before I begin, I'd like to preface all of this with just a few personal remarks. <clears throat> and basically, I think uh, a month ago, a little more over a month ago, I think we all got a, a wake up call. At least I did when I went on Norfolk Net, and I, I found this photo of Highland Lake, better known as the Mud Puddle. And then further investigation <coughs> uh, revealed the fact that someone, quote, quote, had removed two boards from the, from the dam and emptied the lake. So here we go. Uh, back in the 90s, the town was all shocked by the fact that there was a massive release of raw sewerage from the, from the sewer line <coughs> that skirts around the edge of the lake. <coughs> and it was great concern, and there was a lot of fuss and fuming. The ultimate solution was to we forced the state to abandon that line and put in a new line via the streets to reach that built a plant on the north side of Campbell Street. And then basically interest kind of, well, that takes care of that, and it went on the shelf again. Uh, the pond's been there for over 300 years. It goes back, as far as we can trace it, into the 1690s. And it was an original grant from the town of Rentham to anyone who would build a good corn mill, they could have the privilege on the Stop River at, at, the, at the Stop River Falls. And the, uh, as, as I outlined for you, the Morse family in Medfield uh, picked up on that offer. And as near as we can calculate, uh, Jeremiah Morse, who lived on the corner of South and South Street and what is today Route 27, he had his big farm there. He was a wheelwright and he was most interested in putting a sawmill to provide a goodly supply of hardwood for his, for his trade, for his wheels, and a small foundry to provide the sims to go on the wheels, the, the metal bindings. So that it became a family enterprise uh, from sometime in the 1690s till 1740. And at that time, uh, the uh, members of the family signed off. And, and in Bertha Fale's history, she has a copy of the deed where they all signed off their rights to their brother, Benjamin Morse. And he became the sole owner of the privilege and the land at Highland Lake. He then evidently approved, from what we can gather, the dam, and he sold off a third of the rights to, to James Blake, the blacksmith. Uh, this is Blake of Stony Brook's descendant. And he was married, uh, Benjamin was married to James' sister Sarah. So it was all in the family. And it goes from there, and it goes down, as you can see, through the families, and then the switch from the moss to the fails, because of the switch between Peter Fales and his uncle Amaziah. And then the Fales come in, and then Aaron Fales, Amaziah's son, decides to put the puzzle back together again. He gathers up all the rights, and he creates a bundle of five-sixths control of the dam with his brother Nathan with one-sixth. And that five-sixths is a solid bundle from 1825 until 1936. And it passes down from one mill to the next. And you could trace it. I have here the deeds for the transactions of the various mills that were there. And from one mill to the other, it's written right into the deed. The Fales family, in order of descendants, controls it. And the mill owners paid the family annual rent of $85 a year. The lease includes five-sixths of the dam rights, the West Bank, of the river, right, and, and, and a control of one-third or five and a third acres of the mill pond. And that's what the Fales owned, <coughs> and that's what they were renting to the mill owners. 36, everything changes. And in 36, the uh, Carrigan is the last occupier, Lewis Carrigan is the last mill owner at Highland Lake. He basically, in the midst of the Depression, the paper mill he's operating, closes. He doesn't pay the taxes. He doesn't pay the lease. The lease, of course, cancels, and the property and the rights go back to the Fales family. The town comes after him, closes on his property, and does a tax taking. All right. The, uh, 
Thales family, all that's left is Bertha Thales, her stepsister Sarah Lewis, and her sister-in-law Alice Thales. So that's the Bertha et al. on the on the on the deed, and she has now is closing up affairs and going to move to East Douglas. She sold the family home on Boardman Street, and she wants to close out her other holdings here. She's leaving Norfolk. So the state comes to her and says, we would like to buy it. We would like to buy this, your rights to the privilege and what you hold. So you have a deed in 1936. The Commonwealth purchased it, right? And the <clears throat> basically they bought five-sixths of the dam rights. They bought the five and a third acres of the mill pond, and they bought the strip of land that runs along the edge of the river. And I have no evidence and can find no evidence, nor can anyone at the registry find any evidence that the state has ever relinquished that. It still holds it. And I have a picture here. This appeared in the 1970s Centennial book, which is a picture of the Grindle. I have the original photo here. Uh, a picture of the Grindle with a sign that the state posted at that time, which clearly states, Department of Correction, no trespassing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> a blow-up version. <laughs> so up to this point, Highland Lake was not a problem because the mills had controlled it and the mills had regulated the dam they maintained the dam, they opened and closed, they removed the boards, they put the boards back in season so that there was a natural flow in the river mm -hmm. and through the bed of the lake. But after the mill closes, now it gets, you know, they're just photocopies. So after, the dam after the mill closes, then there's a, there's a vacant period, there's nobody there, it's nobody's bill, there's empty buildings, this vandalism obvious because the main part of the mill has a fire and burns down. Uh, the the uh, boarding house across the way that had once been the mansion of High Squire Miller Pales burns down. So basically, if you go to Highland Lake today, it's hard to find a trace. And you say, that was all there. Well, it's all gone and all it's all overgrown. So it's very hard to imagine these things as having been there at one time. The Next step is the, is the 30s, and I have for you, I went back and I, I pulled this out, and this is just a quickie that takes you through the 30s. In the packet that, that you received last week, there is a map in there, it is H. You can find H. This is a this is a uh, map, a, a plan that was drawn by the Wall family you know, when, in 1925 when they were going to sell the Highland Lake Mill, and they were offering this up to the buyers as to what they would get. And they uh, basically you find that what what they did was they numbered the parcels to the mill. All right, that's what I've done here on the first part of this outline. And the, the two triangle pieces, one of which you've already visited before, the one that we're trying to make a trailhead to get into the park, uh, the two triangular pieces are leftovers. When Silas Fales sold the railroad a right of way through his land, those two pieces were cut off and left on the other side of the tracks. And they're dangling over there. And then the mill, if you are familiar with Highland Lake, if you know where the Arch Bridge is, mm -hmm. all right, if you start at the Arch Bridge and you take the strip of land that wraps around Campbell Street back up towards the river, that's where the mill was. All right. Across the street, the, the uh, uh, Nichols House, which now Award bought and has, has done extensive renovation on, that house was built by Silas Fales himself. He got the money from the railroad, and he and his son built that house with the funds that they received from the railroad right away. 
All right. He owned that, and he owned all the way up the other, the other side, that side of the street, all the way up to the, to the hill. You'd cross over the river, and you'd get up, if you know where the little Moss house, the 18, 18 uh, Campbell, the little house perched on the hill, just after you crossed the bridge, directly across from that. There were seven acres that went all the way that down on the north side of Campbell Street and came all the way down to, to the Archbridge site where the, where the Silas Fields house. And that was his land. That was the home lot. And then finally, <clears throat> the leased land that I just described to you is, is shown here, and it's marked on this map right over here. It's the, it's the West Bank. It's this land here, and it runs up here to the railroad right away, right? And includes, and includes this building out front that's still standing mm -hmm. is actually on the leased land. And a very corner of it is on the right of way that the railroad has to get up to what was its rail its its railroad station, the old Island Lake Station. All right, so that's the picture. Now we're concerned first with the mill lot. The mill lot, the Carrigan failed to pay his taxes, and the town took it, and the lease canceled. The town then sold that tax land to John Conroy. In the late fifties. The two Conroys die in succession, and their daughter, Catherine Huey, is in charge of the estate. She sells that mill lot to George Nichols. She also sells the home lot to George Nichols. George then turns around in the same year and sells part of the mill lot to Carl Nelson. What he sells to Carl, if you read the deed carefully, is the east bank of the Stop River and the last remaining building, the one that's still down there, with, that Carl Nelson used as a garage when he was living. <coughs> and he included in the deed are whatever water rights that were held by the mill. And the water right held by the mill was one-sixth control of the dam. After, after the Nelsons pass on, first Carl, then his wife Dot remarries, and then when she dies, is her estate is in charge or is, is in charge of her son, Peter. And it's Peter who is executor of the estate of Dot Jeevas, who sells the, the uh, uh, lot B to Kevin Roach. And lot B includes, and again, you need to go back, and in the packet, this would be the other one you want to look at. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not there. Well, the that's she sent to us online. Yeah, that's right. yeah. It's like 30 pages. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're down here. Let's be on the other side of this one. Yeah, here it is. We want K. So K is, is off the, uh, the plan. Uh, of Lot B that uh, was sold to Kevin Roach. <clears throat> it includes it includes the east bank of the river, which is correct. That's what he bought from Nichols. It includes the area up up behind the MBTA's right of way, along the along the banks of the railroad right of way. But it in also includes, if you'll note the building and all the land on the West Bank, which is incorrect. And why I did this, this, this second one for you, this brief abbreviation, is because if you examine these carefully, those two maps, it appears that Nichols, Nelson, and Roach have all made the same incorrect assumption. If you buy the building, you automatically own the land underneath. And this is one of those rare instances where that is not true. Hmm. Because the mill built that land, built that building, that extension of the mill, over, over the land they were leasing, which they had the right to do. Hmm. <laughs> it also appears that when Nichols bought and then subsequently, within months, resold part of the mill lot, the title was not researched, and the plan that was drawn by P.A. Wilde is incorrect because he shows Carl Nelson as the abutter on the West Bank, and he's not. 
And since it's a minor, it was a minor transaction, and I don't imagine a very large sum of money uh, passed uh, transferred hands in the process. Nobody bothered to check, and they just went ahead, did a simple quit claim deed, had the surveyor, you know, map out what have I got, and that was the end of that, and they put it in the file. And by then, of course, the state had kind of had disappeared from the scene. I'm sure that somebody had taken that Department of Corrections sign down as a souvenir after the state left left town, because they were they were done. They had completed their 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 sewer line to the filter plant. It was operative, and they had no longer any need, because the only reason they wanted that was so they could control the level of the lake because in digging the sewer line by the edge of the lake, they had to be able to lower the lake so they could do it for the construction. Once the construction was done, they had no further purpose. So they put it in the dead pile. But somewhere in the archives of the Department of Correction, that deed is there and the state still owns it because no, there's been no transaction out. It hasn't gone the other way. So now basically, if you if you uh, if you proceed from there, Nichols actually sold Carl the last of the mill buildings. He sold them the western section of the land, and the deed specifies to the thread of the river, which means the middle of the river, and whatever water water rights the mill had, that was one sixth. The building sat on lease land from the fails, front corners on the right of way, railroad right of way to the old Highland Station, and the mill rights the mill water rights were one sixth dam right as the other five six were in the Fales lease. The Nelsons proceeded as if they owned the dam, and their son proceeded to sell to sell the same to Kevin Roach, and Kevin has assumed the same attitude that it's his dam. Because that's what he was told. Which leads us to where we are. <laughs> So uh, it's our intention uh, to try to resolve the ownership of the dam. Um, you know, who, 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 who owns that property? Um, and we haven't taken any action uh, to put forward a proposal one way or the other. Um, we heard the concerns of the neighbors regarding the water level. Uh, it's uh, not consistent with uh, what uh, you know, the, the situation that uh, seems to uh, take place every now and then is not consistent with the uh, original purchase of the property that the CPC helped fund. Uh, and purely, uh, the, the only reason why we're here is to uh, ask if uh, you could um, bring town council in uh, with the information uh, that Barbara's uncovered uh, and uh, quite possibly resolve which direction we should look at. Should we look at possibly just the upstream side or do we take ownership on the downstream side? Um, does it make sense to have two control mechanisms or one control mechanism? Uh, and if there's one control mechanism and if it's downstream, then who maintains that? And if it's the town property, then the town should maintain it and it should be in the best interest of everybody in the town. If I can, if I can add a little, another few few thoughts on this. <clears throat> One is that there were no problems with the dam and with the water level in the lake until we get to this critical period when the sewer, sewer overflow. Then everybody's attention went on, oh, Highland Lake, I didn't know that was there. And since then, the problems have multiplied. Now, we heard at the, con at the CPC meeting, there were several citizens from K King Philip Trail came and they lent us some insight, lent me some insight as to what had been going on. They explained that, that when, when Dot Cheevers or Nelson was alive, she served as the caretaker of the dam. She took it on herself, whether she believed she owned it or she just took care of it because nobody else did. But she was the caretaker. And that the care of the dam there was very simple. I mean, it's a simple device. Mm -hmm. It's not a major river. There's not a lot of great water pressure that you're holding back. It's, it's very simple. It's a simple little mill pond. All she did, they said, was that every spring, every fall, when before the hard freeze, she would go down and remove a board from the dam to accommodate the ice for the winter. 
Hmm. And when spring came and the ice was out of the pond and the drain off, of the, the winter drain off was complete, in other words, the snow had all melted and the flood waters had, had receded, she would go back and replace the board in the dam. And that was it. And that as she got older, she encouraged them to help her and made them promise that when she was no able, longer able to do it, they would continue to do so. And this group of citizens from King Philip Trail, some of whom still live there, have been there since the houses were constructed, continued to take over after Dot passed on the duties of caretaker of the dam. But then we began to get the do-it-yourselfers in there, and then the fun began. And we had some who thought the, the be-all was plug up the holes that go under the railroad and we'll keep the water in the lake and it won't go down every season when summer comes. We had another group that said, uh-oh, that's good, that's causing floods. Look at all this extra water near my backyard. So they decided, let's take a, let's take a board out of the dam and let the water out. I'm not going to have my backyard flooded. So we got two counter groups around the lake, one trying to keep the water in, one trying to let the water out. In the process of this over the last 10 years, they've made a mess of it. Now you go down there in the summer and you can't stand the stench that the lake has gone stagnant because the normal flow of water, the lot water, had, the lake has not recharged itself each season because the boards haven't been in and out of the right sequence. They've been out when they should be in and in when they should be out. And all these meddlers have really muddled it up and they've destroyed the ecological balance of the lake. The, the inspection that Kevin had done of the dam came back positive. There's no risk. It's in reasonably, it's in good condition. It's not in major need of repair. It's a very simple mechanism. It's simply uh, a little spill pool that comes through those ducts, that stone duct that the railroad built onto the tracks into a holding pool and then a spillway over the boards in the dam. That's it. You take a board out, you spill out more water. You leave the board in, you spill out, you spill less water. And that's how you regulate it. So it's, it's no, you don't be, have to be a rocket scientist to run this dam. It's very simple. Uh, my suggestion and, and when I was going through the conservation files, trying to review all this and, and put it all together, my suggestion was I came across, and I'm sure you may or may not be aware, but Mira Lake had similar problems uh, about 30 years ago. And Mira Lake solved them in a rather interesting fashion. And here we are involving two towns because most of Mirror Lake lies in Rentham, and a very small portion in Norfolk. But the dam at Mirror Lake is in Norfolk. So we were on the front line. And after Aggie Bristol bought the mill, she gave, of course, the uh, Stony Brook area to the Department of Natural Resources, to the Commonwealth. Mirror Lake is Stony Brook Reservoir. And it was, it was in the control of the mills because that was their water supply to power the mill at Stony Brook. Hmm. So therefore, when, when she did that, Mirror Lake, actually the, the dam at Mirror Lake passed into the control of the hands of the state, like the one we have at Highland Lake is in the hands of the state. A agreement was struck, believe it or not, with the state, and it's a partnership the state owns the dam at Mirror Lake. They, they had a committee, a Mirror Lake Study Committee, which is now defunct, so it's no longer functioning, as an advisory board. And it entrusts the regulation, maintenance of the dam at Mirror Lake to the DPW in Norfolk. And that the two towns concur on the management of the level of the lake. And there's been no complaints, and it works. So I offer it as a possible alternative to spending a lot of money on building more dams, uh, buying more dams. The other alternative would be, uh, and, and it has its, this has its merits also, and that is to buy Kevin Roach out. 
by the dam and by the land he holds in that B because the land, the other part of the land, has historic value along with the mill site. You already, the town has already acquired two thirds of the mill site because the Nichols' son uh, deeded it to the town for a dollar. So it would mean getting the, getting the west, east bank of the river. If we were to buy the west bank and the land up on the, next to the railroad, up on that land next to the railroad is a stone foundation of the blacksmith shop that was structured there in the 1740s by James Blake. And when the railroad came through in 1849, they made them take the structure out, but they never make them take the foundation out, and the foundation is intact, virtually intact, and still there. And it's one of the remaining artifacts of the old site at, at, at Island Lake, so it has a historic value. It would also be an addition to the parkland, and it would tie in, it would link in on the other side of the railroad tracks with the parkland that we already hold. At, at Island Lake. So that's another avenue to explore. So I'll share one thing with you. This I've come in. This is a stove that was manufactured at Highland Lake in eighteen hundred and thirty seven. <laughs> I take my, I'll and give it back, I promise. No, no, mm. you can look at it. the the uh, tell you the story. It was it was on on eBay Ten years ago, and it was sold, and the president of the Walpole Historical saw it on eBay. He thought it was interesting, and he he made a copy off of eBay. When when Charles Harding of Walpole and I did the study on the settlement at Stop River Falls, we discovered what that stove was that that uh, John Anderson had found, but we didn't know where it went and who bought it. About a month ago, John was surfing the web, and I don't know what he was hunting for. Well, we had found some old kettles down in the cellar of the, of the society, Walpole Society uh, headquarters, and he was trying to find someone that could, could evaluate them. And he came across this hospital doctor, stove doctor, down in, New, in Rhode Island, Little Compton, Rhode Island. So he contacted him, and he took a couple of pots down there to to uh, have them evaluated, and lo and behold, there's the stove. This is the second owner after it went on eBay. He bought it from the first purchaser, and he's a stove doctor. He restored it. It is beautiful. Mm. It's in pristine condition now, and he's repaired it, restored it, and it was the uh, it's two years before the boundary closed at Highland Lake, when it shut down in 1830, excuse me, in, in 1839 and was sold uh, to Ellis and converted it into a paper mill. So you never know what you're going to find. So uh, again, uh, just to kind of circle back, uh, yeah. you know, the CPC would like to see something done uh, with regards to control of the water levels. Um, we know that uh, any work that's done on the upstream side has to be in coordination with the MBTA because that's an active control line. Um, so the uh, cost estimates that are in here could be significantly off depending upon what they come back with. Um, whereas if you're on the downstream side, uh, a lot of that might be uh, uh, not have to be taken into consideration. Um, and if we look at the downstream side, um, as Barbara has uncovered, uh, how do we go about um, verifying the exact ownership through town council, uh, making the appropriate offers if that's the direction we want to go? So. Barbara, thank God this is on TV so I can watch it again because it's going to take me six days and 24 hours of rest to try and recover. <laughs> I know it's a lot. Just, went through. But just, just figure that yeah. I've been working on this since 2005, so. You are <laughs> an incredible gift to the town. You, I don't know how you do it. I don't Basically, know how you remember all this. It's, it's amazing. Well, this was, my, this was my field. Before I went into teaching, I originally trained as, in historical research. Oh. And then in teaching, you have to, you have to remember. You have to remember. <laughs> so it's, um, it's easy. 
Well, I, I mean, first first thing, I mean, clearly we ought to clarify ownership. Yes, I think that's that, that's where that's, one. That's a no-brainer. Um, so I, you. Yeah. Yeah, and that I think uh, uh, once one. we once we establish that, it'll give us a basis, a direction to move forward yeah. with. Yeah. You know, um, but wouldn't it? And, and this is just. But see, even if even if you buy even if you buy Kevin out, and we, you know, the account council agrees that the that the the, the dam rights and the West Bank belongs to the state. Then you don't have control of the dam. Well, but I, I, if they've abandoned that site, I, I suspect that we can work that one through. Well, I think because I think that's a precedent. I mean, right. they've done it once for, for a dam in North Park. Yeah, I, I, and I don't think they have any interest in it anymore. Right. And this could I, I be an easy out. Yeah. And I, I mean, basically, would, then I, everybody comes away happy. Yeah, I've got to believe the state is actually the least of our. our yeah. Yeah. In other areas, they're the biggest concern, but in this particular one, I suspect they would be the least of our problems. And then there's an interesting, when you, when you read through that Mirror Lake contract uh, mm -hmm. note on there, and I, I don't know, let's see if I can find it quickly. It's on the, uh, it's on the second, the revised part of the agreement. And yeah, it's, it's on the last page where it says the la uh, number six, Liability. The towns, by acceptance of this agreement, assume all liability for any cause of action arising out of controlling the water levels in the lake. The towns hereby agree to hold and save the department harmless and identify in, in, from any and all claims or demands or damages, either in law or equity arising out of virtue, control the water levels and maintenance of the dam. So that's what the state asked back in return. So they, they got out from under on the liability. And the towns have to assume it, but well, as as Paul just pointed out, the liability with the dam at Highland Lake is is negligible. Right. There isn't enough water there to do much damage. I mean, we could have a hundred year flood, and I don't think there's much. In fact, there was more damage. I was reading. Uh, what did I read? I guess it was in the in the Globe West Sunday. <laughs> Medfield had some problems further down the Stark River with the beavers. Mm -hmm. And the flooding and all, right. and I think the beavers did more da more damage than a, it, than a it, failure yeah. of the dam up and here. And we're lucky there's not beavers yeah. on Highland Lake down by the dam entrance. There, I I think there are. Yeah, well, I have a hunch there are, and I also believe there's some up and back behind the prison. Yeah, could be. Yeah. <laughs> well, town council, by all means. I mean, let's figure out who owns it. But yeah, um, and then. At least conceptually, we—I mean—we own a beautiful piece of property, and um, right. we have to make sure that we one advantage ourselves of it, but also protect it. Yeah. And of course, but by the other point I might too make in in terms of Kevin's property, is if if then it is proven that he does not own the West Bank, then the man has bought two worthless pieces of property. He has the East Bank. And he has this other little strip of land up and back by the railroad tracks, neither of which are, you can't do anything with them. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that he wanted, the building, you know, the garage building that Carl had used, he doesn't get because that's on the state property. That's on the, on the lease. So buying him out might be a, a, a shall I say, a fair alternative. Because figure he's reasonable alternative. Well, I mean, he's owned it since 202. He's been taxed on it since 202. They're taxing him as if it were a, a 30,000 square foot house lot. And even in its present state, it's not buildable. And if you take away the West Bank, which he thought he owned, it's definitely he has two pieces that are not buildable. So his he's at a total total loss. And yet the property has, as I point out, historic value. Right. I mean, we can we can warrant that as as having value historically, particularly if we can save that structure of the of the blacksmith shop. Well, wouldn't it seem that we have two immediate things that we need to do? One is to obviously research the ownership, which right. that's that's the first step. Sounds like you've made 
council's job. They'll charge us an astronomical <laughs> amount of money. Like they did the last time. Like they did with the and, triangle. And, and, and probably yeah, just copy your much. material. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my guess. bill. But anyway, um, <laughs> but wouldn't a, a second uh, situation, especially with the uh, ambiguities associated with ownership, we need to ensure that, that it's not tampered with somehow at this point in time. Do something to it. I mean, if the state owns the majority of that, um, I would think that we, with a, a letter to the state, could get quick permission to gain some control over what goes on there. Well, I would think, too, just, just looking at the, the structure of the dam, and I think I included it in the you packet. Did. Yeah. Uh, it's very simple. It is. And you could it's probably a you could <laughs> yeah, probably it's put yeah. you could probably put two 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 steel put a lock on it right. and and simply put a lock yeah. over the top right. and you just kind of take those boards out of yeah. because they'll kick them in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah, just we, we the whole intention is we want to prevent the situation that came up as a uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we we talked about it. I talked about it with Bob McGee, and actually that was his suggestion. Yeah. Uh, you may have talked with him too. Don't we? Uh, we haven't really spoken to anybody I, my else. Suggest, my suggestion to him was to put a beaver cage over it. You know, they, these 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 chain link cages they put over the areas where the beavers are trying to build, and they encase them mm -hmm. with with chain link, where the water is running, where the beavers want to build and shut it off, it. and the beaver can't get at the yeah. can't get at it, <laughs> or people. Or people. Yeah. 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 So you you could encase it, you know, just in a, in like like the utility does, put a, a, a chain link enclosure to keep them out. Well, uh, I mean, uh, aren't we in agreement? Yeah. I mean, we we need right. to. Can we bring up something? Yep. You, you need, need to grab a microphone, ma'am. Right there, in front. make sure the green lights on, please. It, it's it's not for uh, it's for the folks at home. And just okay. identify yourself too, please. Okay, King Kingfield Trail. We're right. the folks that Mrs. Nelson asked on the duties of the dam for. Mm -hmm. As you figure out what you want to do going forward, we have an immediate short-term issue. We're down to a small river right now in Highland Lake. We have, since the last meeting, somebody's fooled with the water levels again. Uh, we, we put in boards in the spring, which you're supposed to do in the spring. And we brought up the level to where it normally has been for the, since we've been there since 1976. And we've been doing this for all those years. And now it's down that um, we have, what, maybe ten, 10 times the size of this room width in terms of dr all dry land now. Uh, we, I would not call it a lake. With, without mentioning it on camera, without mentioning anything, are you aware of who is doing this? I no, do I, not do, know do not definitively. I, no, I'm, I do not know definitively. Okay. I did not see somebody do it. But uh, I was going yes to your lock issue because we did put boards in. Water was brought to the level. Mm -hmm. It's not a um, big question about what level. If you look at the rocks in the middle of the lake, it shows you right where the level is supposed to be. No question. All right. Now, the good news is we have more land than we ever had before. <laughs> But don't tax me. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, but the, the bad news is, and Barbara and I share this, the animals are, Highland Lake is a migratory path for many different types of ducks, many types of geese, uh, heron, blue heron, gray heron. You have the otter in there. You, and yes, we do have beaver upriver off of Seekonk Street. Matter of fact, when you call across Seekonk Street, you know where the Stop Wait, River goes under? Work? You can see the dam right over there okay. by Seacorn Street. But anyways, there's lots of it. Right now with all this land showing, we are losing the animals because mm -hmm. you have coyotes and you have other predatory animals. So we are, and it has drastically changed uh, what's going on, the echo uh, system of the lake. So I know things take longer, <laughs> but we need to think of a short-term solution. Agreed. Because we used to do that, and we did do it, what, about a month ago? Jack, you guys did it this time? So a month ago, so a month and a half ago, we had the meeting. It was brought up. And then after the meeting, right after the meeting, within a couple of days, it started falling again. So a recommendation is, <laughs> and now there's no trespassing signs all over the place. There's vehicles. You can't do the path that we used to always do for 
you count the years since 76. We used to do a little path up there, put them in. Uh, easy to do, you stick them in. Yeah, not rocket science. But anyways, we need, some we need somebody to do something short term. Is there it needs to be two boards put in and some type of locking mechanism to keep, keep some individuals from knocking them out. Is it where it's, is the dam in the condition that it's supposed to be at this point in time, or is it? Well, oh, the dam's in good condition. No, the no, board's no. in place. The, are now. the boards in place now? No. They're not. The boards are kicked out again. Kicked yeah. out. Everett Benton, King Philip Trail. Um, the boards were just kicked out about three weeks ago. About, about three weeks. They were put in about a month ago, and they were kicked out again maybe a week after that. So, uh, so would a locking, you know, would that, that wouldn't solve it? If they yes, that would solve it. it. That that would solve it. <laughs> it would be a short-term solution. It would be a short-term yeah. solution, but it would be very effective because um, to, for them to actually break the boards without being able to move them up a little right. bit would be very, would be much more difficult. They'd have to put in much more effort for it. Yeah. Um, I can respect the people who say that uh, in the wintertime it's too high because the boards weren't taken out. But um, their solution doesn't even follow simple physics of you know, water level. It's kick them all out, take them all out, <laughs> so that it goes down completely. You yeah. know. So, so the only other thing that, that yeah, I think we need to look at um, as the town uh, and the costs, uh, if you look at the solutions uh, on the upstream side, we have one alternative, which is, which is a gate installation on the Highland Lake side, in its uh, total project costs estimates are two hundred and seventy-four thousand um, dollars. I think we have to look at that versus the legal aspect of acquiring the land, the maintenance, and possible re-engineering on the downstream side, and the purchase of the property. I think the other two. Well, I, I guess my I, I haven't I'd have to study this a whole lot more, Paul. Sure. Uh, there's one other, there's to one to give other a, thing too, Paul. You have to pay, answer. factor in there. Don't forget you got you got the MBTA to deal with. Right. I mean, and the water the water goes under there, under their embankment. I may be simplistic in my view on this, but I think there has I think there's a, an easier way to do this. Um, if Kevin only owns one sixth of that, I I, I suspect that we can do fairly well with the state that they, they probably gift us the land what yeah. I'm taking a wild guess but let's make the assumption that it's surplus land and they gift it to us um, and and we have some there's some bartering that we could do to make that work uh, because they have some needs too down at the, at the prison yep. um, so take that part and let's just make a brash assumption and you're right if he owns one sixth and so on the negotiations there should be less stringent than they were before mm. um, and then get control of this uh, and fix it to the point where the DPW much like you've done in Mirror Lake and I, I want to read that document again but it, oh, well, as I say when I ran across that I thought yeah this this fits I mean if they did it once but before yeah before I mean again I've, I've got to believe I may be dead wrong but I got to believe that that would be a far less expensive approach to this because I remember the original price that Kevin wanted from that. It was 150 or yeah, something. I, like I thought it was 175, but in yeah, that range. Yeah, in that range. Um, he was asking assess, but the town was assessing him. Right. For a pro for a house lot, which it was obviously going to be a lot less than that. Because we can only pay appraised value. Yeah. And and, and it has we to could be by ownership rights. We could right, fund so out of our contingency. Yeah. Uh, we can fund the appraisal. But that doesn't solve their immediate no, problems but on the no, lake. I mean, I, if, if that's something that needs action I would favor. I would favor instructing the DPW to go down and get at this right away. Right. Put the, lock, you know, put put the, the locks layout. on and secure <coughs> this. I'd take that risk. Yeah, when we have those. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit of experience with dams from my days in the chemical industry, chemical plants and such, and, I, and I, it's, um, it's a delicate issue particularly if there's question in terms of ownership of the dam um, in terms of the Board of Selectmen directing the DPW to do that. But um, I agree, it sounds like that's what should be done. I just wouldn't see, a, I wouldn't want to see us direct the DPW to do something that we're not um, 
authorized to do, I guess. That's, that's the only concern I have, Jim. Yeah. Well, there's risk. Yeah. Um, there's also risk in not doing something. Right. Well, maybe we can, as you propose, do something in partnership here with the Department of Corrections to address this immediate issue. You know, even before, you know, deeds get, you know, changed in the early late, late, late. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we might be yeah. able to do I mean, something. Unfortunately, nothing, you know, it has, too much it, the legal yeah. process has two speeds, slow and lethargic. Oh, I know. Um, the uh, committee um, that deals with the, uh, the prison, is that something that, you know, they have relationships there that they might be able to at least? Uh, it wouldn't be through that group. Um, Jack has a contact. I'm trying to remember who it is. Um, we, d we do have a contact down there that we could talk to to find out more about this. They probably don't even know they own it. be my best guess. Well, I've, I've, I've talked with a few people. Do they know they own I, it? And, and the way they explained it to me is that the state has like two pockets, and this pocket is full of land that we're using, and this pocket is full of land we own, but we don't need it right now. And it's sort of like a dead letter office, mm -hmm. and they kind of like it's there, but we don't know much about that, and we don't bother including it. Okay. And if you go through all the records in the state, and I've been online, I've spent hours on there, seeing if I could find where they've hidden it, and uh, it's you can't find it. It's very well concealed. Well, if they list you, everything else that's active, but anything inactive. Let me ask you a question, Jeff. Uh, with regards to the, until we establish ownership, let's just make the blanket assumption that Kevin Roach owns all the property on the downstream side. Because if you, if you look at the way it's been assessed, it would appear that way. All right. yeah. uh, would the Board of Selectmen be willing to approach him to have the town come in and replace and secure boards? such that they can't be removed by other parties? That certainly would be a better situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert in terms of knowing the... I mean, I don't know, know if the neighborhood is a strictly legal perspective. Mr. Roach on that level? Yeah. Make sure that I is on green. Uh, Ever Benton. Uh, yes, he was approached. Oh. Your last three years, he gave permission. He said no problem, no issue. Um, his people associated with him helped us at one time um, put boards in just to have extra manpower. Um, and then all of a sudden, this last year, the no trespassing signs went up. You know, junk cars get moved in front of the walkway where we used to walk up and those kinds of things. What the rationale behind that is, we have no idea. Were they, were they placed there by the property owner? Yes. They were? Yes. They yeah. were. I think I think I might shed some light on that. Kevin, I'm, I, Kevin does all the repair work on my car, so I know him and his father quite well. And my, my impression from what I've learned from the two of them is that they have been under a great deal of pressure that they are the culprits in taking the boards in and out. And the, Kevin's got rather thin-skinned on this. And in terms of, you know, at first he was cooperative and deny, you know, I didn't do it, I'll help you. But now this has persisted, and I think he's, he's kind of pulled up a hard shell around himself, and, and he's in a protective mode, and thus the no trespassing signs, et cetera. So that, well, uh, without without encroaching on his rights, right. I mean, there's certainly no downside to. I mean, I oh, know I, I know I Kevin think, as well. I would I think mean, such an offer would be in his best interest. I would think so too. Because if if he is, as he's demonstrated before, concerned, then basically this gives him an out. I think one other thing that he he frequently mentions when I bring up the subject, uh, and that's his liability. With these people trooping in and out there and, and doing this, that they're going to get hurt, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I'm going to be that. liable because I own it and blah, blah, blah. So that, that's another, another angle from which it might be approached, that this would you know, alleviate that concern. If, if, the, if, the, if the boards and the dam are secure, then that minimizes the, the opportunity for people to get in there and be meddling around and hurting themselves. And it is. It, it's rugged up in there. Everybody tells me I, I wouldn't dare venture in there myself. 
But just from the pictures, I mean, you can see it's not, you got to be a pretty good mountain goat to come out of there. <laughs> so that might be an alternative short-term solution. Yeah. And then work on establishing the ownership, and then we yeah. figure out which direction we want to go from there. In um, your research, Barbara, at any point did you see reference to, like, the um, Army Corps of Engineers or, you know, that agency in terms of... Well, the only activity the Army Corps of Engineers is, is up beyond the filter plant. And they, they took the land up there as part of the, the uh, Charles River Natural Valley storage. In fact, that's where Bertha Fale's original land was, and, and they, uh, they, uh, it, was, it had been incorporated and disappeared into the town forest, and they took it as part of that storage area. But that's further up. That's above the, above the filter plant. I don't know if you people are aware of it, but while I was surfing the other night, the... Uh, uh, state has plunked seven million into their filter plant, and it's a new state of the line, and it's got all kinds of membrane this and that and whatever, and it's the ultimate, and they're about to, to I guess, showcase it as one of the finest in the in the nation. So if you go on a Department of Correction filter plant, filter plant in Norfolk, it comes up, and it's a very long, beautiful pictures and all kinds of graphs and what have you. Well, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, it is, because I figured they were dumping the waste into the river. Yeah. Perhaps the, the first step would be to just have a discussion with Kevin. An they asked Kevin discussion. to come tonight, and he promised me he wouldn't, he didn't. Yeah, that, he chickened out. because the whole well, it's on issue of the... Yeah. the the dry, dry lake that's sitting there now, it would go away if well, that lock were put on. <laughs> yeah. right. And all it that yeah. takes is permission to put the lock on. Yeah. And all this could be solved without a lot of money, without a lot of effort, without a lot of legal yeah. issues. Um, but it needs someone more than, you know, neighbors who... Yeah. You know, do you know Kevin? Might no, I, I, I know Kevin. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 I, I just think, you know, uh, rather than the CPC, we're just a funding mechanism, and we yeah. make the recommendations. And, and, and I, don't, the town. I don't blame Kevin for not coming tonight. Yeah. You know, I mean, oh. Especially with that level of sensitivity, and we're on TV, and, you know, I, I don't blame him for that. I, this oh, is, I don't either. This is a one-on-one -on -one kind of conversation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would think he'd be receptive. Uh, we'll, we'll do the work. We'll do it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Anyway. Yeah, Absolutely. And in the meantime, get get a hold of council and now who send them your follow up with council. Um, Mr. Chairman, you want to send a note to Mr. Hathaway? Yeah, and uh, Jack too. Okay. Or Marion. Yeah. <laughs> Whose budget? Our new town it? administrator. Yeah, yeah, new town administrator, <laughs> Marion. Thank you. <laughs> Whose budget does that come out of the CP? Oh, that's what you want. That's that's what you're really getting at, Paul. Yeah. That's Jack. On that well, you team. have you have more money than we do. Yeah, also, no, no, no. I mean. <laughs> We'll clarify that too. Our budget, I think, is two hundred dollars. So. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Barbara. Yeah. Thank well, you very, very much. A lot of work. Um, thank you guys too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. you all for coming. Well, I don't know. It's the biggest meeting. Well, I'm here. Um, you're more? You're right. no, this, I, I ran across this in the conservation. Hey, 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 Mr. Chairman. Yes. Hey, Dan. Is that bar, is that land under you guys or is that under us? Conservation. Or is it under Board of Selectmen? I think it's under the Board of Selectmen, isn't it? Still under Still the Still under the, we didn't put it over to conservation yet. Okay. Here's the other half. Right. Thank you. This is predates all of you, gentlemen. I thought you might invite it. I moved here in '94. I'm trying to think. I don't remember that. That's why I just moved. Oh, I remember. I remember this. I know. Yeah. I just yeah. got here. I went. Yeah. It's the I remember press. this. Oh, this yeah. was, this oh, was the. Uh, Eruption of the pipe. Yep. The, the I, I well, do remember all, that. Yeah. yeah. That was a big deal. Yeah. I'm sure to thank, thank you, Paul. Th Paul, thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. I just got it. I wouldn't have bought my house there, Barbara, if you told me. I'd already been here a year. Uh, yeah. right. Could I get a copy of this? I think this is. I'll back you yeah. with the box. Thank you very much, yeah. Barbara. Yeah. I really appreciate all the work. I speak yeah. for it's an incredible amount of work, Barbara, but remember. you always do. Uh, you're you're a treasure to the town. That's what I do. But you are a treasure to the town. She doesn't have to look at her notes. And I, she I, just keeps going. I'm, I'm, in, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to retain it. Never mind. <laughs> and I read the material. <laughs> I still can't. Good night, Thank Barbara. You. Thank you. Good night. All right.
So will you um, talk to Mr. Yeah. Do you want me to? I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't want to do it on TV either. No, I don't blame him for that. Yeah, no, uh, no. no. I mean, it's not the kind of. I mean, yeah. it does. He's, 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 you know, he's not done anything wrong. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean some people. I, just, I feel bad if people mess with He's, he's a victim, and as much as everybody else is. Exactly. And oh yeah, you got Barbara's oh. picture right there. No, those are more important. Oh. Yeah. Barbara. Still on camera. Do we have any, Jeff? Do you have anything else before Mr. Lee hands it back? Uh, I don't think so. I uh, just referenced tomorrow night. Uh, is the um, so uh, is it tomorrow night? I think five yeah, p.m. Tomorrow night is only five p.m. Yeah, the working. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, I cannot. Here. I cannot attend tomorrow night. So if one of you could go in my stead, that would be terrific. Yeah, I'm going to try to do that. Okay, five o'clock. Okay. Anything else? You, you're going to go, Jeff? Just going to go. Sure. Yeah, I think I'll be back in time. Good. To Thank you. What else? Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> I'm still. No. I'm still. Besides that, besides fixing the dam. Wow, what a wealth of information. Hmm. Um. Oh, she got one. Oh, okay. One more, Marion. Marion, one more. One more. Sorry, here yeah, I can run. Out. Okay. About a motion to adjourn then. There you go, Marion. Um, yeah, just, just one comment oh, on that. Um, I went up there and, and looked at that, um, and, uh, and I talked with Bob McGee about it. Uh, he, he thinks that he, got a, he has a solution to it that, that will stop the fooling around with it, number one, but also he, he felt that it was more manageable at a far Less expensive. Well, that's you know, well, it's not broken. Yeah. Sense it, you know, I mean, anytime you go out, they're they're not going to come back with a cheap solution, no matter what you do, because that's not the business they're in. Uh, I don't think we need to, to go in that direction at all. Now, I'm not a damn guy. You know, I mean, I do understand how water flows. Uh, I, I've got to believe that there's an easier, or simple way to fix this. And it's fixed. It just does the they need to I, not, I agree. fix it. The right, you know, play with the boards. It sounds to me like at the wrong time, right? Right now, it just seems that yeah. people are messing with the boards at the wrong time. Versus yeah, I can't. The damn I not can't working. get down there tomorrow, but I'm gonna see Kevin on Wednesday. Okay. Um, I mean, he's. I mean, my heart goes out to him if yeah. he's been stuck in something that is this convoluted. And, yeah. And people don't you don't wish that on anybody. Yeah. Wow, what a story. Uh -huh. Amazing, the history of it all. Well, it was, it was a riveting I, story. I've I seen that foundation she's that. talking oh, Mary, about. I, I, had no I, I had no idea what that it was. was no, We're idea still, no, we have not ended yet, Christine. I'm sorry. You want to go on top? Uh, let Christine go home. Uh, I don't have any other. Okay. Uh, okay, Mary, when's our next meeting scheduled for? What date uh, is it? 22nd. Uh, 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 We're in July. Wait a minute. July 7th. July 7th, okay. Yeah. Next, our next meeting is July Another 7th. Monday. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, a motion. Anyone have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Wow.